Good morning on this Memorial Day weekend. Thank you for being here. Um, let's, we're going to focus in these first two songs on the Lord's name. Turn in your chorus books. I have to turn to two pages. Number 83, Jesus' name above all names. We'll sing that first. Um, and then it, we'll turn to 170. Lift high the name of Jesus. So put a marker there or your finger in 170. And when we're done with Jesus' name above all names, we'll move right into lift high the name of Jesus on 170. Let's stand and uh, sing. Or you can just look at the screen and you won't have to turn it all. for your name thank you that it's above every other name and that one day at the name of jesus every knee will bow those who are in heaven and on earth to the glory of god the father thank you so much for that in jesus name i pray amen thank you you may be seated announcements tonight brother woodward will be here uh, and he'll be preaching the first two verses of Ephesians, the intro to Ephesians, um, 6 o'clock, so please come back for that. Pretty soon, not very long away, will be Vacation Bible School, July 17th to 21st, and we'll have just a short promotional video if, if Dan is ready. All right. Focus on the screen. Light, darkness, good, evil. 
truth. Lies. We are engaged in an epic battle between two spiritual kingdoms for the hearts and minds of our youth. Every day our kids are bombarded with lies about who they are, who their creator is, what is right, and where their salvation comes from. But we are not meant to fight this battle alone. God, the ruler of the good kingdom, has given his kingdom keepers spiritual armor to wear. With this EBS, your kids will learn how they can be a part of God's kingdom through salvation in his son, and they will be equipped with the armor of God as they train to become keepers of the kingdom who stand strong in today's battle for truth. Huzzah! So as you see, that will be the theme, the armor of the Lord, Ephesians 6, 10 and following. Um, again, July 17th to 21st, there are sign-up sheets, I believe, in the foyer um, for where you can serve. It will be in the evening VBS as it's been for the last however many years, quite a few. <laughs> also, Tim Votsford can always use more lawn mowers. There's a sign-up sheet also. And if you can just mow, that's fine. The, he can take care of the trim and everything else. So please sign up or, or mention it to him, and he'll tell you what you need, where the keys are, and so on and so forth. Right, Wednesday night, we'll have Bible study and prayer. That Notice that we'll be in the choir room, um, Isaiah 42. Next week, next Sunday night, our teens will have the... the entire evening service to minister to us so come encourage them next sunday night looking forward to that uh, they always do a great job and also getting kind of going back to vbs uh, two weeks from this uh today after the morning service there will be the first vbs meeting and then july 9th uh, will be the second one uh, about a week before vbs starts are there any other announcements that need to be made that I've neglected? All right. I was talking to just one update um, before we go to prayer. Um, we'll sing our cares course and then go to prayer. But Anthony Juma has cancer and he's had chemo the first round of chemo has gotten rid of about 80 percent uh, praise the lord for that but he will be going through starting another round to hopefully to get hopefully the rest lord willing so let's pray for him and uh, his family as well let's sing our cares chorus and then we will pray <laughs> for this time to come before you and cast our cares upon you. Uh, we have many cares, many people know about, and many, probably many more that people don't know. We cast all of them to you and pray for those that only you know about. Pray that you'll show yourself strong in each request. Um, teach each of us what you would have us learn through the the things we're concerned about, the, or the things we've laid at your feet and thrown at your feet. Do think of those around us, those we work with, those in our families, um, neighbors, acquaintances that do not know you and that are going through this life is difficult 
in this world and in our culture. Pray that uh, they'll see and find hope in Jesus Christ. Help us to proclaim your word. Um, and we think of the missionaries too. We pray for them, maybe even now, if they're speaking and ministering. Encourage them today. May they have a great day in you. And uh, may many souls be saved today for your honor and glory. We're grateful that Jim had his angioplasty this week, and uh, we're great. Pray that you'll continue to strengthen him, help him with what things he deals with. Uh, may they be able to now move on to his the pain in his uh, back area and neck area. Pray that you'll work there for your honor and glory. Do pray for Pastor as he's away. Give him traveling safety. Think especially of his mother. Pray for him in this situation not being there. And uh, pray that you'll encourage her, help her to finish well. Thank you for the um, hospice and how they have and are making her more comfortable. I pray that you'll just encourage her heart and keep her focus upon you. Grateful that Terry and Kathy are here this morning. Pray that you'll continue to work, uh, help her with her strength and um, and Terry also. Pray that you'll encourage them. Thank you for their sacrifice to be here this morning and uh, just bless them for that. Pray for Deb. Uh, she was sharing uh, to me that it has been a difficult week and the pain may be spreading. We pray that you'll just work, show yourself strong, uh, encourage her and Mike's heart, and uh, may they trust and rest in you. Pray for Brother Noise. Ask that you will continue to help him with the struggles he has each day with mobility and seizures. Pray that you'll uh, just be with him, comfort him, and be with Julie also, his wife. Pray that you will, uh, if it please you, may the side effects of the medications not uh, hinder him too much, but may they also do the job that they're designed to do. Think of Brother Juma, grateful for your answer to prayer and what the chemo has done so far. We pray that this next round will work, uh, help him with the side effects and the, and the consequences of that, and encourage him, be with him and his family. Pray for uh, people of Sudan, pray that Help them with all they're going through, the just trying to flee danger and, and having to go 80 miles and walking. I pray that you'll just encourage them. Use this to bring many souls to yourself as well. Think of Ukraine, the war still going on there. I pray that you'll help the believers, uh, help them to continue to minister, and may there be many souls saved. And uh, pray that if it please you, that you'll stop uh, this this conflict as soon as you can. Pray for the Millers and, and Pavilion as they minister today, First Baptist and Pavilion. Pray that you'll bless them for their service and ministry for you. Um, may that church find a pastor soon. May they find your man and, and pray that you'll uh, work again for your honor and glory. Think of the few gates and pray for Dawn's mother, Maria, especially help them as I'm sure there are hard days and uh, it gets discouraging, um, caretaking. Pray that you'll encourage their heart today as well. Pray for Dan and Janelle and Grace. We're grateful for the really miracle you've done keeping her this long. Pray that, you, that you'll continue to help them trust you. Keep Dan safe as he in his job in the police department. I pray that you'll encourage him and help him with all the evil and wickedness he sees each and every day that he works. Pray for uh, Larry Berry, the Railsback's relative, and pray that you'll, as things have not gone well and as as it looks like you're going to bring him home soon. I pray for comfort for him, his wife, the family. Pray for wisdom and, again, help him to finish strong in the family. Give them grace in their suffering. 
we do think of the teens as they will have control of our or take over and minister to us next Sunday night. We pray that you will may it go well. May you I know they've prepared long and hard for it, and I pray that you'll be honored and glorified. Think of parents of young children and grandparents too. Uh, may we all aim and strive to have children that are first of all saved and then grow up to love you and want to serve you with all their heart. We do think of our first responders, we think of our country, our county, our city, um, and even the world and with all that it's going through, how we've turned our back towards you, we have thrown you out of our culture, even out of our lives. Um, pray that for mercy and grace and pray that you will bring, as we've prayed before, souls to yourself for your honor and glory. And may those who know you grow and become more conformed to the image of your son. Lastly, we pray for our persecuted brothers around the world, brothers and sisters. We ask that you keep them strong when they have to say something. May they stay true to you. May they honor and glorify your name and uh, just help them. And, and be with their families and strengthen their families as well. Thank you again for this privilege to worship you. We ask that it will be pleasing in your sight. In Jesus' name, amen. Turn in your hymnals to 201. 201, there is a Redeemer. We'll sing all the verses. Every step. 
step we take. There are times when circumstances make perfect sense to us as we try to understand each comes turn in your hymnals to 368 368 speak oh lord we'll sit we'll stand and we'll sing all the verses standing as we sing
this time it's our privilege to have Brother Reed and his wife here. I should have introduced them sooner. I apologize for that. But it's good to have them here. Uh, Brother Reed is the executive director of IGM right here in Henrietta. So he didn't have to come too far today, <laughs> which is nice for him, I'm sure. Lord bless you as you minister. Thanks, Steve. I appreciate it. Can everybody hear me okay? No. Lapel mic working, great, great, good. Well, I am so thankful to be here this morning. I've been here before. Uh, one of our persons who works at IGM, I'm sure you might know her. Anybody? Anybody? She is a wonderful person, and we love her, and she does a great job in um, serving all of our folks all over the world. Um, I don't think we could really do the job that we do there at IGM without having Holly. Um, she is a great navigator and help assisted me where Brother Gary left me. <laughs> so I just want to tell you good morning and thank you. My name is Dr. Lex Reed, and I am privileged to be here with one of my teachers, George Heckert, sitting back here on this middle row. Um, I'm very thankful because I've had men... And I've had women along the way that have taught me God's word and ha allowed me to be the man that I've become. But I just want to give a big shout out to my brother George back there. And I know his wife is not doing too well today. She's, uh, just be praying for her. Um, I'm very thankful that we have um, some of the great privileges that we do uh, here in IGM. But if you'd bow with me in prayer. I want to lead us into where God desires for us to go today. God, thank you for allowing us to be here this morning, that this morning we come to worship you. We come to set aside this time to say, Lord, this day is holy, just like all the other days, but today is very special. Today's a day that you say you're supposed to rest. Allow us to rest today and recover. And Lord, I, I just pray that you open our, our hearts today. Open our ears that we may hear, and Lord, that we can enjoy the privilege that we have of worshiping you in a country where people are not burning down the buildings, they're not rushing in trying to kill us, and Lord, we do it out of the joy that we have of coming here today. Open our hearts again, Lord, open our ears, and give us swift feet to do what you've called us to do. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Well, I don't know if you know this or not, but I am one of the most fortunate persons on planet Earth. I've been married to my wife here for umpteen years now. We don't want to get messed up in those numbers because it'll get us a little, little trouble. But my wife, Shelly, grew up right here in the Chile area. But God has given me the great privilege of being in the military for 37 years I was in the military. I got to go all over the world and retired from that. And God called me to do something else. And while I was out, out all over the world, I got to see that, you know what? The world is not like America. <laughs> a little, little different out there. They do things a little differently out there. But God, in all of his wisdom, decided he wanted me to come back to New York. I can remember telling my wife specifically, scratch New York off the list. Okay, we're going south down to Texas, and no, we're not going to New York. Or maybe we would stay in Tennessee. That was our other option. I was living right outside of Nashville at the time, and um, um, we're not going back to New York. I'm not doing that. But you know what? When we tell God I'm not doing something, guess what happens? Does he do a little corrective action along the way? Anybody ever happened that happened to you? Yeah, okay. But here we are in the wonderful land of uh, taxes and lots of rules. Wow, I was kind of surprised about all the rules that we have to have here in New York. So uh, down in Texas, they just say, well, brother, we just trust you. <laughs> we just trust that your car works as it should. Just go on down the road. Just pay your taxes. So... Anyhow, I, I'm just, again, we, we kind of came here kicking and screaming, but I'm very thankful 
that God enlightened my eyes to what we are doing now. Um, Pastor Joel said, all right, now how, how long are you going to be up there speaking about IGM now? So I'm going to be real careful. He said, I, don't, I need for you to come back and do that. And I go, Roger, check, got it, man. We'll come back and talk about IGM the next time. But I, I can't open up God's word today without sharing a couple stories from our guys out there in the field. And I'm praying that it encourage you. Pray for Brother Anthony Juma again. I got to talk to him on Monday, and I check up on him. I pray with him every Monday. He's very encouraged because he has a church here in America that prays for him. Got another one down the road that prays for him. Got several in this area that pray for him. Continue to pray for him. He's a good man. I got to see his work firsthand. But as the dust is settling here in my life, uh, we have been able to focus our, our energy on what is called the national pastor. That's what Brother Anthony is, the national pastor. Who is that person? A national pastor is a pastor, or we would say missionary sometimes. But these are people who live in their, this country where they serve. And that's the ones we focus on because, guess what? These folks don't have to learn the language. They don't have to learn the culture. They don't have to learn how to do a lot of things because they grew up in there and then they went and got their Bible education somewhere else. And then they came back and they said, this is where God has called me to serve. It's very difficult for American missionaries to go over to a place like this. And that's the reason why... Um, most missionaries, not most, I, won't, I don't say that, but many, many missionaries will fizzle out about the three-year mark. And guess what they'll do? They'll come back home. Our national pastors don't have that privilege. That is their home. But you know what? We're coming behind them and we focus on supporting them. And our pastors live and serve where God has planted them. You know, things I've noticed along the way. Let me share a few things real quick about things I've noticed along, along the way in Kenya. I just got back from Kenya and Uganda, going to India soon. And it's beyond, I think, what that, how the churches operate there. It's more than just day-to-day. They operate day-to-day dependence on one another. Believe it or not, they do that. Day-to-day dependence on one another. They come together. And they're unified. And so this is what we do. This church is not a, an event that we do. Church, we are the church. People come and join us, and we become the bigger, bigger church. And I love being among these people because they're the most simple, the most humble people out there. And it's, in, it's incredible. It's encouraging And it makes me feel like, what can I do without? Do I really, really need all that mess in the garage? Right? I heard our pastor down at Open Door say, he he did the the barns thing. You know, do we need to fill more barns and build more barns? And I I just kind of like, ow, front row. Uh, So here I am coming back from Kenya and Uganda with the same story. But in a lot of these countries, you may not know this. If you walk up into this thing here, I believe it's a baptistry. And you jump into that thing, you say, I want to come become a believer in Christ and I want to be marked for death for Him. That's what happens in countries overseas. They get marked for death when they step into the tub. Why? Because they lose their identity with the culture. They become, their culture and their family becomes Jesus Christ and His followers. That's what happens. And what happens to these people, sometimes persecution will come. Harsh Harsh treatment. And people in India, they live in the caste system. And most people who become followers of Christ, they're already at the very bottom anyhow. And then when you throw another level up underneath that and say, you're not even worthy to be part of the caste system, you're so low. 
That's what happens to the folks there in India. And when people are killed over there and they're Christian, you know what they do? Case closed. Don't even have to, don't even have to investigate. They need to be dead anyhow. That's what's going on in a lot of countries. Again, just stepping into that baptismal tank, and people know about it. They know that you've become identified with Jesus Christ. A young lady over in Iraq came to me, and what a privilege it was leading her to the Lord. And she was starving to death. She says, I've left everything to come and find out who this Jesus person is. I need to know who they are, who he is, who his followers are. I want to identify with them. And her husband had a death threat out in the community where she lived. If she comes back in this community, stone her to death. Kill her. And she tried to sneak in one time. And her children saw her and they spit in her face and they said, you are not my mother. Because she desired to know who this Christ person was. So what does she do? Turns all of her brothers in who were with Al-Qaeda. And she comes to me because guess what she saw on my uniform? A cross of my uniform. Maybe that guy's got some information that I can get from him. So I got to... Share with her who Christ is. And she says, I believe it. I believe in him. I want him to be part of my life. I left everything to come and follow him. Because I knew that he lived out there. And the day that we baptized her, her name was Dahli. The day that we baptized her, She invited all the Muslim interpreters to come, and they all sat all across the front row in a chapel. And guess what they heard that day? They heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news. And I don't know how many of them may have heard it for the first time. Maybe that's the first time they ever heard it. Maybe some of them even trusted Christ that day. But we baptized her there in front of all of them. This place was packed. It was a big tent there in Iraq. And we handed her a microphone. And it shocked me how how much of an influence, how much of a sponge a person can be watching the body of Christ at work. I used to get up and I had to, as a chaplain in the army, you have to kind of do everything. You're like, okay, uh, I'd sit there and play. George, you probably heard me play guitar before. I'd play guitar and I'd say, oh, well, turn around and say hello to somebody this morning. And everybody says hello. And then I was monkey around and do something else. And then I have to get up and speak. So I was like a one man show. But I'll never forget what she said. My name, and here's a song that I always used to pray, uh, play on a guitar. I loved it because I'd put, play like three of them right in a row. Um, had them memorized, locked in my mind. Um, um, nothing but the blood of Jesus was one of them. But one of them was victory in Jesus. You know, anybody know that one? Man, that's a good song. It is powerful. You know, the weird thing about it was we had a full band that played it, and we just turned up the volume, and and everybody enjoyed it. We had a good time. Handed her the microphone, and somebody got to to preach it to all the Muslims all across the front rows there. And she said, my name used to be Dahli, but today my name is Victoria. Because I have victory in Jesus. Pretty sobering, isn't it? And boy, I tell you what. I don't know how many men or women that ever came to trust Christ as their Savior after hearing me preach, giving my whole heart to them. Fifteen months from their dragging bags going all over that country. 
I don't know how many of them trusted Christ, but I do know one who did. And she knew the cost of getting up in the baptistry. We, we did it in a box. We filled it up with water. We invited all the Muslims to come and watch us. What an event. It's a little different event than what we have here in America, isn't it? Being a pastor, being a chaplain, being a minister gives me the great privilege of baptizing my own children sometimes. I baptize both of my children the same day. But guess what my daughter says to me? She works down in Greece and we're driving back and coming back. And she, she says, I'm getting baptized again, Dad. And we as Baptists, what do we do? We kind of shudder and like, whoa, whoa, you only need to do it once. Right? You know what she told me? Dad, I was just going through the motions. I want, I, I want to do this in front of people and say, I serve a risen Savior. Jesus Christ is my Savior. And I want to proclaim Him to everyone with my actions about being baptized. And I'm saying I'm following Christ now. Actively following Him. And I'm going to do what He tells me to do. Man, I had a lot of other things to tell you today. <laughs> That's how it goes whenever you start thinking about your family and get emotionally involved. But I got something for you today. I'll tell you a couple of other stories here. And then I want you to think about a man named Godfrey Barasa. He is in Mombasa, Kenya. I just visited him the other day. And um, he has a little small little Bible college where he trains men there. And I'm thinking. Godfrey, why do you want to live in this? I don't know if you know anything about Mombasa, Kenya, but lots of Muslims there. Lots of people that are totally against Christianity. That used to, if you look up the history of Mombasa, that used to be a port, and, and the Muslims started that port of, uh, of trading there. So they've got a huge stronghold against anything that goes on there. And while I was there... You hear this, you know, loudspeaker and a car driving by, and he's got a, a, a fence outside. He's got a wooden or um, uh, um, cement fence along the way. And I'm hearing this yelling, and, you know, I'm like, what are they doing? He goes, they're yelling at me. They're screaming over their bullhorn, yelling at me driving by in this van because I stand for Christ. My family, we stand for Christ here on this part of the world. And about a year ago, his home was broken into, and they tied him up in chairs, and he tied him up on the floor, his whole family. They tied him up. I was in tears when he told me this. They sexually assaulted his young daughter of 17, 18 years old. And he had to witness that in front of them. And then a couple of weeks ago, I get a, uh, get a message from him. I thank you for sending money to put a roof on my house. Um, we had to take down, I, like I said, you know, they, they loved it whenever I came because every time I left a place, it started pouring down raining. And that was a sign of God's blessing. And so they think of me as being the guy that brings the rain. Uh, so everywhere I went there in Kenya, in Uganda, that's what happened. Godfrey said, you know, this thing here, when it starts raining, because it, it was all made out of the uh, palm branches, that's what they make it out of, it's going to leak right through and we're going to be sleeping in the rain. So I said, let me get back and see what I can do. Sent him money, but they didn't have enough to fix the top of it, finish the top of it. Bandits got in, got inside. What do they do again? 
They break his arm this time. But I get in the Zoom meeting every Wednesday with these guys all over the world. All over the world. And um, he shares with me. I said, God, for, I asked him, God, for, are you certain God's called you to Mombasa? Without hesitation, he said, yes, this is where God wants me to be. I'm here to make disciples of everybody that's here. And I pray that those men who attack me now and the ones that attacked me a year ago, I pray and believe that they will come to Christ and trust Him. That's kind of hard to believe, isn't it? That somebody would stay there and say, I've been, this has happened to me twice, but he's had a good attitude about it. I want to take you to India real quick. There's a man there named Pastor Vijay. I don't know if anybody knows him. Vijay Kumar Gunta. I don't know if he came here and spoke before. I see a hand back in the back. But this man was dragged out of his home and beaten by the police. And guess who's the one that turned him in? His neighbor next door. The same guy that lost his job and begged him and came to him and Vijay gave him two months worth of food and says, anything else you need, you come here. And that's the rat that turned him in. And so he, here he is beaten bloody, has a white shirt on. He goes, well, it's pink after that day. I can't wear it anymore. Um, but here blood is running down his face. Bruised and battered. And the officer, the, the officer that arrested him, he reaches down inside of his pocket, which is full of blood, reaches down inside his pocket and he hands him a tract. I just want you to know that Jesus loves you. Hands him the track, and the guy takes it from him. BJ saw that man a year later. You know what he's doing? He was out in his car doing this. He was reading scripture. I don't know if it was a result of him re receiving that tract and reading it, and saying, yes, I want to trust Christ as my Savior. But that's what happened. He said, are you a believer now, brother? He said, yes, I am. So we never know when we give people God's word what's going to happen. God will take care of all of that. You know, I have a million of these stories just like this. What a privilege it is that Shelly and I can be able to serve in this capacity that we have churches in our, our community that stand up and say, we will go to bat for our national pastors and we will support them. Thank you, Lord, for people like you. Thank you for putting skin in the game. We appreciate you. But these men and these families, they live in chaos. They live in torture. They live in basically hell on earth. But you know what they're, they're saying is our family is here to make disciples. That's it, bottom line. That's what we're here to do, and that's what we will do. And I know their ma mantra is this disciple is going to make disciples. That's what these folks do. They do it out of self-preservation, but they also do it because they love the Lord. And they, they also do it because they have read and studied in detail, what the Great Commission is. What is that? What is it? We'll take a look at it here in just a minute. Why would these people risk death every day? Why would they go up in a, to a baptistry? Why do they do that? They want to be marked for Christ because it's better to live for Him than to live a lie. 
Where do people get this from where they commit themselves to Christ every day? Where do they get this stuff from? They read encouraging words like this in Matthew 16. Then Jesus told his disciples, If any would, would come after me, he let him deny himself, take up his cross, right? And follow me. For whosoever would save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. They believe it. They believe that taking up the cross is worth it. It's worth dying for. Better off is worth living for. That's where we get life. That's where we have life abundantly is when we carry the cross. And it can be a joy too, can it? It is a joy. It's a privilege that we get to carry the cross. What will it profit a man if he gains the whole world and forfeits his soul? Or what shall a man give in return for his soul? What? So I invite you to take a look today at the Great Commission. I don't know if any, anybody's ever seen that movie I've never seen it all the way through, but you ever seen that movie, Man, Men in Black? They get this little thing, they do like that, and it erases everybody's memory where they are. So, I'm going to erase your memory here, okay? Hear it again for the very first time. But our believers across the globe b believe this. These believers, they live out this text, and I'm going to read it to you today. I want you to hear Again, for the first time. Matthew 28, 18 through 20. And Jesus came and spoke to them saying, All authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go therefore and, this should be bolded, underlined, circled, highlighted, scratched, whatever you want to do with it. Because I know your Bible in a pews are New King James versions, right? It says, make disciples. When I was studying my doctorate, I studied this passage for three years. Over and over and over and over and over looked at it back and forth with my uh, advisor with it. Try again. <laughs> so, we look at this passage once again. Go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations. Baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Teaching them to observe all things that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Our people in IGM get this. They understand this passage. They embrace it. They live it. They enjoy it. They reproduce this in other people. They know that disciples, a true disciple will make other disciples. You know, for the most part, I have seen this all over the United States, all over America. I believe we've lost the vision. I'm just going to say it. I walk into a lot of churches. We've lost a vision for discipleship. We've lost a vision for evangelizing people. It's scary. You know, when I was interviewing for a few churches, I thought, man, I'm just going to... Uh, I was a therapist my last five or six years in, in the Army. I was a marriage and family therapist. And I thought I wanted to get into that world until I walked into and stepped on the rake of the civilian world. Going out of the military, I stepped on this rake that went, boom! And I found out that world, the world out there, is not so forgiving. They were very condemning of the Caucasian male Christian. 
where I worked. And I like, God, I can't do this job, so what's next? So I thought I was going to look for other churches out there. And I started interviewing several churches, and I found there's a lot of them that really wanted me. We do Zoom calls back and forth with them, okay? And I was watching. <laughs> it was funny. So I was allowed to ask some questions, and I was watching people on these Zoom calls. There you know, all kinds of people, the deacons, the pastor. Uh, that never the pastor was never in there. It was always the, the, the committees or maybe some elders of the church. And here I am doing this face to face with them. And then they're like, "Oh man, I think we want to bring this guy on." Boy, I can just feel it. Woo! This is like my third or fourth round with them. They're wanting me to come in, and <laughs> I was allowed to ask questions at the end. Would you like to ask questions, Doctor Reed? Oh, yes, i got a couple of them. I'd love to ask you a couple questions. Hope you don't mind. Don't mean to be offensive or anything with these questions, but, you know, could you tell me what day or days does the church meet together, you know, where they take out other people and train them how to evangelize, train, train them how to tell people about Christ and invite them to trust Christ? What days or day do you guys do that? I'm, I'm curious. Have you got it marked on a calendar each week? And then the other question I asked him was this. Hey, uh, could you tell me what discipleship material that you guys use to train people and to be, to be more effective in, in, in reaching others for Christ to evangelize? Can you, what do you have? What do you think the answers were? That's right. Crick, 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 cricket. You hear crickets. You know, and then a lot of them are like, <laughs> you see the most confused looks on people's faces. Oh, ooh. <laughs> you know, <laughs> they started losing control. <laughs> oh, I got to go to the bathroom. Oh, I got to get to a meet. Woo, boy. That was too much to ask. And I thought, those are just simple. Are those simple questions to ask somebody? What's your plan? What do you do? Well, their thoughts were, well, we can remember back sometime way back when, when, you know, they're all kind of looking at each other like, like when brother so-and-so was here, he kind of did that stuff. My heart just sank. Is that the pulse of the church? I'm talking about God-fearing, good, godly preaching churches out there. This is what I'm walking into, walking out of the military? Are you kidding me? Is that the state of America today? And I also got involved with one particular church there. It's a nice new church plan. Man, it's going 100 miles an hour, wide open. And I asked the pastor about, you know, about evangelism and discipleship. And here's what his response was, verbatim. I remembered it. That is not part of what we're doing right now. I'm not going to lie to you, Lex. I'm more concerned about preservation and taking care of my family. Pretty sobering, isn't it? That's the state of churches today. That's what I personally walked into. I'm like, I don't know if I want to be a part of that ever, where people don't proclaim God and, and tell people to go tell people to go tell people, train them, enjoy our time with each other. But you know, looking at this passage today, many Baptist circles, what, what we've always done is we've emphasized the wrong, we've emphasized the participle in what's in this particular passage. And what's the participle that's in that passage that we get hung up on? The word go. We get hung up on the word go. Or, better, better way of saying this, while going is what it's talking about. While going is, how, is the emphasis of this passage. But in Baptist circles and churches across America, we emphasize the go, and that overshadows, let me point this to you, 
it overshadows what the main verb is. Make disciples. Make is the main verb. So lasting, last words are lasting words. That's why Christ's church went out and made other disciples because the emphasis wasn't on going and being busy. The emphasis was on what? Making disciples. Busyness is not what God is looking for. What is busyness? Many things. We can have fellowship. We can do a lot of things. We're busy, busy, busy. But the imperative is, if you don't do anything else, we have to make disciples and pass the baton. And that's an enjoyable thing that we can be involved with. And I know that Jesus, how does he get there to the Great Commission? How does he get to the, wait, I'm going wrong here, right? Start over here. Finish line's over here. How do we get to last words or lasting words, go make disciples? How do we get here? We have to backpedal a little bit, and what does he do? There's four things that Jesus does with his disciples. He does four things with them. He signs them up. He suits them up. He has them to show up. And then the last thing he does, now you got to go send up others and do the same thing. So if I was going to look at this passage, those are the blueprints of what Jesus does. Sign up, suit up, show up, and then send up. How does Jesus do it? He points out certain people on the way. If you look at this, this is incredible. I love looking at this and how Jesus goes out and, and gets his disciples. He calls them by name. He calls them. If you've heard Billy Graham's message before, what does he always say? Any person that, that Jesus ever called, he called them publicly. So here we have a pairs that are along the way. There's three pairs that he signed up. Who are those people? There's Andrew who, who told his brother, Peter, hey, drop everything, we found the Christ. So then Christ comes and meets Peter and Andrew. And while he was there, he also meets James and John. He enlists them, come on board with me. Who are the other people that he'd linked up? Philip and Nathaniel. Come on board with me. I'm going to make you all fishers of men. And then there's the singles that maybe, I don't know if he did these in pairs or not, but I'll, I want to mention their names. There's little James. There's Simon the Zealot. There's Thomas. There's Thaddeus. Thaddeus. And we all know who's last. Judas Iscariot. And what does Jesus tell these guys? I know later on in the book of Matthew in chapter 19, the disciples say, we left everything to come and follow you. <laughs> Remember how it starts off though. In John 15, 16, it says this, you didn't choose me, but what happens? But I what? I chose you. You didn't come to me, I came to you. And I pointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that you, your, your fruit should remain. That whenever you, you ask the Father in my name, He may give you. You know, disciples in the time of Jesus... They would find the rabbi that they wanted to follow and they would go ask him, I want to be one of your followers. I want you to teach me. It's important that you teach me. But this doesn't happen. Jesus says, I'll go find my own followers. They will follow me because I've called them, because I've chosen them. I chose them when? Before the foundation of the world. We can go all the way back to the very beginning. He chose them. Well, he chose us in Christ, right? He chose all the people that are in Christ before the foundation of the world. You know, this must have been strange to them 
that the most popular rabbi in town comes and singles them out. Guess what he's done for us, folks? There's no different, there's no different from when Jesus chose his disciples from when he chose you. There's no difference. Because that's why we have a living document, the living word in front of us that says, come, follow me, and I will make you fishers of men, you fishers of women. He chose you. He chose me. He pointed you. He pointed me. And He's giving it all to you. If you've come to Christ and trusted Him, He's given it all to you. It's that time. If you've ever been to the races before, my son runs, runs um, in track now. He runs track. And there's a, have you ever seen the relay races that they do? The 400 meter relay. There's been relays that's been run for the race of Christ, the marathon for him since the Great Commission. And guess what? It is now given to this church. Have you accepted it? God, I am going to run the race if it kills me. I'm going to make disciples if it kills me. I want to share with you one last couple seconds here, if you don't mind. Have we got time to go another hour? No, just kidding. (laughs) Don't get your rocks so soon. I wanted to share something with you this morning. And I'll close with this illustration. I think a lot of us, and a lot of churches all over the world, mainly America here, we've lost the vision about discipleship is because a lot of our pastors were never discipled. They got a lot of learning, they got a lot of knowledge. They know how to preach. They know how to do a lot of things. Not just the pastors, but just the people in the congregation as well. Nobody ever came across, came to you maybe, and said, Hey, Bill, Fred, Tammy, Shelly, I'd like to take you along a journey that you're going to love it. It's going to be fun. You're going to enjoy it. And you're going to see God in full technicolor. And you're going to see him for what he's worth. And you're going to want to worship him more and more each day of your life. You'd probably want to know what that is, wouldn't you? So, I'm just going to let you know, my pastor came to me after I came and trusted Christ. As a matter of fact, if you're here visiting for the first time, I don't know if anybody's doing that. And they're like, oh man, I don't want this Reed guy up here. My goodness, I want the pastor to be here today. I had that attitude when I came into that church service. That day that I trusted Christ, June the 3rd, 1990 is when it happened. This June the 3rd, guess when it is? It's on a Sunday. I'm going to celebrate. Woo! So, anyhow, he said, and this little bitty guy, you know, about probably five foot tall, and I heard him, I trusted Christ as my Savior. He says, if you've trusted Christ as your Savior today, Come and meet me at the back door. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to help you write a thank you note to Jesus. I'm like, well, how do I do that? I want to tell him thank you because he, he came into my life today. I know for sure. I went back there. I met my pastor. He said, this guy's going to take you the rest of the way, bud. Sure enough, he did. My pastor took me under his wing for the next two years because I was starving to death. I want to know who this Jesus person is. I want to commit my life to him. But what he says to me later, uh, he trained me for those two years. He was actively involved in my life. He showed me what discipleship is. He showed me how to share my faith, evangelism. He said, man, this is easy. And I was like, man, I want to be just like this guy. 
I love this stuff. I can eat it up. I want to do this. You know, recently I heard him down in Florida. We got to go see him down in Florida, and he was preaching at a church down there. And he shared with me, hey, you got something that very few people ever got, get to do. You got to get one-on-one with a pastor, and we're trained effectively. And he was so proud of what he was able to do through me. And I'm thankful that he spent that time with me. But many people, in, maybe in this church here today, never had that privilege of having somebody train you in how to make disciples. But he gave an illustration that day, and he said, you know, um, many people who come to church, they're like pupils. A pupil, what do they do? They're just taught things. Pupils are taught things. Students are taught things. People, uh, pupils um, learn details. They ingest ideas. They, they evaluate true or false, real, not real, good or bad. And most of all, they're just a what? Listener. That's what most churches have today. Listeners. Lots of good listeners. And he said, however, what we need to do is make people apprentices. And I'm like, wow, that's, it. that's exactly what happened to me. You made an apprentice out of me. He did on-the-job training with us. A teacher may say to the apprentice, here's how he says it, go get me a hammer. The apprentice goes, gets the hammer and brings back, here it is. He goes, no, no, that's a tape measure. Try again. Now, let me give you further instruction here, apprentice. What you need to do is you go over there to my toolbox and you get out this thing. It's, got, it's the only thing in there. It's got a wooden handle on it. It's got this thing on the end of it. Go get that. Oh, okay, I think I can find that. The apprentice goes and gets that thing and brings it back. And what does the teacher say? Good. Good job. You listened. You went and got it. Now you want to see something really cool? I want to show you how to use that thing. You want to do that, wouldn't you? And he shows him what it can do. Woo! Man, this is incredible. This is exciting. He teaches that apprentice how to use the hammer. Then later, he teaches the apprentice how to do other things. There's many tools in that toolbox. You'd like to learn more about that, wouldn't you? Yes, I would. Teacher, what else you got to throw at me? Well, let's go out and do this. I'll show you how to do this. And by the time the apprenticeship is over with, a good teacher, what they will do, will unload their toolbox, and the apprentice will know how to use those tools. Matter of fact, the tools might be so good they might go into their own house building business. There's a big difference between being a pupil then, right? Than being an apprentice. Same thing goes for the church. And I think a lot of us in the church, me included, me first, I should say. Me first. I've become so spiritually obese that I too am kind of losing the vision. What is it about? It's about running the track, running the marathon. It's not a sprint. We got another relay that we got to run. Snap out of your gloominess. We got stuff for you to do. And I want to invite you to do something. If you've never done this before in your life and said, I don't care if you're 40, 20, 30, 40, 50, 70, 80 years old, if you've never been trained how to make disciples, I want, I want you to bombard your pastor when he gets back. Say, Pastor Joel, hey, whoo, man, uh, hey, uh, you know, I'd really appreciate your help here. 
I heard a message about making disciples, and man, I'm kind of a little fuzzy there. Can you help me out? I'd love to be able to do that. Can you help me out with that? And I guarantee he's probably going to be calling me like, man, what did you do? There's like 18 people lined up, and they've never gone through this before. So I invite you, it's never, ever, ever too late. And I, think of, I kept thinking about George. I kept thinking about my teacher. And he pressed upon me, just like all the teachers in my past. God's word can be trusted. God's word's true. And I promise you today what you heard is God's word, it's true. Disciples make disciples. Let's pray. God, thanks for this ultimate privilege that we got today of looking at your word. And there's some words in there that are maybe fuzzy along the way. But I pray that this church hears your word and says, God, I want to act upon it. I'm, I need to be brushed up in certain areas in my life. Maybe I'm deficient here or there. But, Lord, that's why, God, you've given shepherds, shepherds like Pastor Joel, to share with people the knowledge that he has. Help him to train others. And Lord, there might be others here that know how to train others. Help them to be revived today and say, God, I want to be busy about doing your will and doing your way and being obedient to your word because I love you. You're my Savior and you are my God. God did give us a great day today. Let us enjoy you and say hallelujah whenever we meet you. We praise you, we thank you, we rejoice in our great salvation in Jesus' name. Amen. We've been called to rise up. Turn to 353. O church, arise and put your armor on. We'll sing the first two verses. Sing it thoughtfully and let's stand as we sing. After the second verse, I'll ask Brother Reed and his wife to go to the back and greet us as we depart. O church, arise. to go and in our going make disciples thank you in Jesus name amen, amen.